This is our last colloquium for the term. Um, and I want to take a moment before, um, before I introduce our speaker today to remind you that we have four presentations coming up uh, in spring term. The first one will be April 13th uh, by Rhonda Fritz, who's a uh, faculty member in College of Ed. Um, and then uh, April 27th, Jennifer, I'm going to, I can't pronounce this one. Pronounce it for me, Rory. Pe Puentes? Okay. Jennifer Puentes, and she's sociology, history. Okay. Um, May 11th is Aaron Thornburg, uh, another uh, uh, archaeologist I, or anthropologist or something like that. Yeah. I get them all mixed up. It's, it's like astrology and astronomy, right? Who gets them? <laughs> And then, um, and then May 25th, we have Colin Andrews, who's, uh, as far as I know, a chemist. And, maybe, yeah, and so I, it'll be interesting to see what he has to say. And all those presentations will be in this room at 4 o'clock with snacks provided. I think that's why most people come. But no, not really, I think. So with that introduction and, and reminder of what's coming next term, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Doc, uh, Donna Rainvoth. Um, who is uh, a member, a faculty member in um, the College of Edu uh, Education. I've known Donna for a number of years in, in different contexts through her husband, Jim, who's here. Um, and um, it's nice to learn something about, uh, about people that you, haven't, that you haven't learned before. So she's, uh, she's taught in Oregon, in Venezuela, at the International School. Um, she came to EOU in 1995 to teach as a natural resource education specialist. I think that's where she and I connected because I have a previous background in natural resources. Um, and she worked with Michael Yeager at the time on, a, on an NSF grant. Uh, eventually, as many positions used to do here, uh, they transitioned into an assistant professor position in education. And she now teaches science methods and other education classes to undergraduate and graduate students. She got a sabbatical in 2016, and with that sabbatical, she went off to Africa, uh, Nam it's uh, Namibia, uh, to be exact, and she worked with the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Well, how cool is that? I mean, seriously, that is, that is so cool to be able to work with animals like that. Um, she traveled with the education team. She was able to put on trainings for, uh, for teachers, and, and it sounds like you even got to work with some students there. Um, she was able to do some research at the, the Cheetah uh, Conservation Fund. So she's out there. I, you know, I, natural resources is kind of a strange profession. Sometimes they stick you out in the woods, and all you do is watch. And that's what she got to do at a watering hole in Africa. Can imagine what comes by when you, when you sit there long enough. Jim, can you tell us what comes by? Or do you want to not tell us about that? Um, anyway, um, in addition to being involved in the education programs, uh, Donna has been, uh, take, uh, was able to take part in science, research. Um, she's going to show us pictures of things she does. And if you don't know about this part of her, she has a cherry orchard and she rents trees. Right? And, and I've rented a tree there for a number of years and have, still have cherries from 2014. That's what happened. So with that, I'll turn it over to Donna. And she's mic'd. When we get to the end and you have questions, I'm going to run around with the microphone. So, thank you, Steve. Thanks for the invite. It's, uh, it's pretty fun for me to put this presentation together because it lets me go back and revisit all the, all the highlights of being in Africa. So um, I really had no idea I was going to Africa. Both of these blinds are broken. So that's unfortunate. I, um, I ended up going to Africa because I, I met Dr. Lori Marker. And I don't know if any of you heard that talk as well, but she came here to EOU and spoke one in the fall, I think of uh, 2015. And I talked to her at the at her presentation and said, do you ever take anyone who's on sabbatical? I was lined up to go to Panama, but when she came, um, I, I totally switched what I wanted to do. And she said, oh yeah, just contact me. So I did. She's the director at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And interestingly, she got her bachelor's degree here at EOU some many years ago. So I, I was fortunate. She said, yeah, just contact me. And I did. And she said, 
yes, we'd love to have you come work in education with us. And, and so I, like uh, someone said, I didn't even really know how to pronounce Namibia when I took that position. And, and so I really didn't know what I was getting into. I, um, I knew I wanted to be at a research center that also had an education program. So it's, and I've always wanted to spend time in Africa. So I didn't really even know where Namibia was. You can see it's down on the um, lower left, just above South Africa. I didn't really know where it was. I had no idea where I was going. Someone asked me, where are you going to be in Namibia? And I said, um, somewhere north of the capital. And they said, yeah, that's most of the country. <laughs> so I, I knew I was going to be in this town that started with an O. I couldn't say the town. I had no idea how to pronounce it, Ochivarango. But um, so Ochivarango is just up by the B in Namibia. And I knew that the uh, Cheetah Conservation Fund was about 40 or 50 kilometers outside of Ochivarango on a dirt road. I looked at it on Google Earth and, um, and sort of tried to picture where I was going to be, but it really was, it really was uh, a surprise. So when I got there, after two days of travel and someone picked me up at the airport and we drove um, four hours to get to Ochivarango and then down this dirt road, I was pretty pleased when I saw uh, this center out in the middle of nowhere in the bush. So we stopped there. That's the office building. And the building to the right was uh, more offices and actually a little cafe. So there's some tourist uh, business and a little um, gift shop. So that was a great surprise. Then they took me down the path, down the road a little ways to this um, hut called a rendezvous and said, this is where you'll live, which looked pretty nice to me. It had, um, had that big, heavy screen door. So at night, I could latch that door from the inside and leave the other door open so cobras or warthogs or nothing could get into my rendezvous. <laughs> I had a thatch roof, so it stayed pretty cool had a bathroom. I had hot and cold running water. I could drink the water. So it came from a well or a borehole. And I had solar power. So when the generator shut down at 11 o'clock at night, I still even had power in my rendezvous. Jim likes to say that he came, Jim came and stayed there for a couple of months. And we both fit in this little rendezvous just fine. And the path between my office, which was up by the uh, gift shop and my rendezvous led me past cheetahs every day. So on both sides of the road, there were cheetah enclosures on both sides of the path. One was probably seven acres, and the other was maybe four acres. So every day I walked back and forth past, the, past these cheetahs. Cheetah Conservation Center or fund is about 100,000 acres, but there's 40,000 acres that are set aside as uh, they call the reserve, and that the animals, wildlife can move back and forth freely on all of that land. This land had no livestock or anything on it, so this was all about the wildlife. When I got there, it was a wet season, so it looked like this. When I left there, it was a dry season, so it really changed a lot. And I learned about all the different programs they had there. So at the Cheetah Conservation Center, there were um, there, it's just grown and grown. So it's been there for about 25 years. Lori Marker started it. There's a full veterinarian clinic there, so a full-time veterinarian and a vet assistant. Sometimes they're working on cheetahs. They're actually looking at the tail on this cheetah. I was telling Rory, every cheetah that came into the center or that's been, had any genetic studies done on it has a kink in its tail. And so this, they were looking at the kink in this one's tail. This cheetah actually came in while we were there. It had, um, it had been eating a farmer's goats. And it had been caught a couple of times. And then the farmer called and said, if you don't come get this cheetah, I'll shoot it. Cheetah Conservation Fund is not in the business of taking cheetahs. That's not what they want to do. But sometimes they end up with cheetahs. It's illegal to breed cheetahs in Namibia. So they're not there for any breeding purposes. And they're not a rehab. They just end up with cheetahs that someone's going to shoot, so they take them in. There were 33 cheetahs when I was there. 
It's also a model farm, so they are trying to showcase how you can have livestock and wildlife on your land. So at, this, at Cheetah Conservation Fund, or CCF, there was um, a herd of dairy goats. And so there was also a creamery. So every day people worked in the creamery. We had fresh goat cheese all the time. The goat cheese was also sold in different markets around Namibia. And the other program they had that was um, a very important program was the livestock guarding dogs. So they were raising livestock guarding dogs that were going out into the, onto the farmers' lands to help farmers discourage cheetahs from eating their goats or sheep. And then they also taught about why it's important to have a herder with your livestock, with your goats or sheep, and to bring those in at night. They had a scat detection uh, dog and a scat detection program. So this dog was trained to mark on cheetah scat. So this, the dog handler, this guy Bart would take this dog out and talk to it and then tell him, find scat, find scat. And the dog would take off looking for cheetah scat. And when it found cheetah scat, it would sit down beside it. Then Bart would collect the cheetah scat, label it, and it would be taken into the lab to be analyzed. And most they were looking for what kind of hair was in that cheetah scat because by looking at the hair, they could determine what the cheetahs were eating. And then they'd know if they had a problem with cheetah or not. The genetics lab, there was a full genetics lab there, and they were the ones who did the, looked at the hair and decided what the hair samples were. And they did a lot of other work on the cheetahs too. So there was a lot of genetics work going on. So it was a pretty big operation. A lot of research there um, from uh, measuring rainfall to, to tracking wildlife. So this is a high-tech rainfall uh, device they had. Anytime there was rain, they would head out in the field. Because you could go for months without any rain. So when it was the rainy season, they were monitoring that. And it was very sporadic how much rain they would get in each of the different areas. So they had uh, these rain gauges, and they would send someone out in the field right away. I wish you could see this picture better. This is uh, one of the watering holes. This is one of two watering holes that they actually kept uh, going all year. So this one had a pump. So other water holes would dry up, but this watering hole they made sure was, had water. So the tank in front they were pumping into, and behind these people in the back was a natural watering hole as well. And there's a camera on that tree that you can't see, so there's a little motion-activated game camera. The, there were game cameras at every watering hole and at several other places throughout the reserve. So every Monday, somebody had to go out in the field and check, had to, somebody got to go out in the field and check those game cameras. And that was always something I volunteered for because you spent most of the day out on the reserve then and you never knew what you might see. So you went out, checked the cameras, took the SD card, the memory card out of them, put a new memory card in, put some new batteries in, and set it up again for, for the next week. And there would be anywhere from 60 to 2,500 pictures on a camera for the week. And when you got one with 2,500 or 3,000, you mostly figured there was probably a blade of grass that was waving in front of it. It's also a rewilding program, a rewilding and tracking program there. So this, this cheetah came in when she was about 11 months old. She, uh, the mother had been shot. So she came in with, I don't know, one sibling at least. And she was there for about two years before they released her and her sister back out into the field. So they'd kept them in a pretty remote area they fed them there, and they felt like they were, they were going to be able to be successful. So they put her and her sister out, and her sister was killed right away, I think by a leopard. But she, Zimzi, managed to do pretty well, and she actually bred in the wild, had a litter of cubs, and then the cubs were all killed by a leopard. So she was pretty 
pretty low for a while. They were tracking her. She's got a collar on, you can't really see. But they were tracking her. They knew what was happening. And then she bred again. So she had four more cubs, and she was really successful with those cubs while we were there. They were monitoring the cubs. So this tracking device got two pings a day on GPS pings, so they knew where she was all the time. And then if she wasn't moving, they'd go looking for her, trying to figure out what was happening or where she might be. If a farmer saw her, they would call and say, hey, your cheetah's on my property. <laughs> and most farmers were pretty most farmers were pretty okay. They knew she belonged to Cheetah Conservation Fund or had been released by them. I went out one day with him when she was on a farmer's land and he had a game farm. And he just brought in a bunch of little springbok. And he's like, you know, I'm pretty okay with her being here, but I don't want her getting in with my springbok. So they were trying to figure out how they could encourage her to move with her cubs. She never seemed to have a problem with eating livestock. <sighs> but the sad thing is, she, her cubs were 11 months old when I left there, and uh, she was doing well. We'd gone out this day because she had gotten her eye punctured, probably on an acacia thorn, and so they were darting her with an antibiotic gun, and they'd gone out a few different times and shot her with antibiotics. But right after we got back to the States, we got word that she'd been killed. She was killed by a leopard, and one of her cubs was killed by a leopard. But they went out the next day and trapped the other three cubs, brought them in, and now they have, and they're 11 months old, same age she was when she came in. So they have those cubs and they're hoping they'll be able to release them. This guy, Eli, had worked with her the three years, so it was pretty heartbreaking for him. And then the other big focus, of course, was conservation of cheetahs and this whole concept of human-wildlife conflict and how do you have humans and these animals living together and try to um, accommodate the needs of both. So one of the first things I did was start doing school outreach programs. So this was Stephanie Bradley. We worked really well together. She was the director of education there and she had an informal education background. So she was from the zoo world. She'd been working in zoos. And I had this formal background, so we worked really well together. And she took me right away out to schools. This was the first school that we went to. I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but we arrived at the school at 7.30 in the morning, and they met us in the parking lot, and they said, oh, we're so glad you're here, but you know, we really don't have a classroom or auditorium big enough for all our kids, so they're going to stand in the in this open area and we'll have you stand up on this walkway and give your presentation. And I, I was pretty worried that that was not really going to work. For one, it's hot. Fortunately, it was 7.30 in the morning. 600 kids. There were 600 kids standing there and they totally, I don't know if they listened, but they sure didn't misbehave and they certainly weren't speaking or, or acting out. And you couldn't give a PowerPoint, so Stephanie knew that. She knew that those were often the cases at these schools, so she had these big canvas prints made of all her PowerPoint. So my job was to flip the, <coughs> flip the print. <laughs> so, I, but afterwards, I went in the classrooms to talk to the kids, so I really wanted to know more about the kids and what they were thinking. They teach primarily in English there. There are 14 languages in Namibia. But the schools are running in English primarily. So I could actually talk to these kids. The thing that's happened in Namibia is in the last couple of years, education has become free for all kids. So the population of students has rapidly grown, which the schools have not really been able to accommodate. So there's not enough desks, there's not enough books, um, there's no materials, not, nothing to teach with except maybe a chalkboard. But, but the kids were engaged and and it was fun for me to be there talking to them. The same result was uh, more kids equals more teachers needed, equals more faculty to teach the teachers. So the whole trickle-down effect from having free education. And then here's a totally different group of kids. We also had kids that came from the United States to Namibia. So a really different class of students coming. And these kids came from New York. And they were at, uh, traveling in Namibia for three weeks. They were high school kids. 
and I arranged some lessons to do with them out in the field. So I put together a lesson saying, can you determine where a cheetah would spend its day if it was around here? Because cheetahs are daytime hunters, but they're only hunting early in the morning and in the evenings, and they need to lay up someplace during the daytime. So I had these kids taking temperature and relative humidity and sunlight and going outside and trying to figure out where a cheetah might rest during the day. This was sort of a highlight of my uh, opportunity there too because I went up to the university in the Capitol and asked the um, science methods person if I could go to class with her. So that's what I teach here. So I said, oh, I'd really love to go and uh, participate in your class. So she had me come to class with her. She taught biology methods. And she said, you know, usually I have about 30 students in my cohort of biology teachers, but this year I have 92. And so she was trying to figure out how to juggle all these students. And after I went to class with her, I went and met with the assistant dean of education in the elementary program to ask if I could come and work with the student teachers maybe. I said, oh, I'd love to come give a, a workshop for student teachers. And she said, yeah, our program has increased from 300 elementary students to elementary education students to 930 in the program that year. So this whole effect of making education free, all of a sudden they need a lot more teachers and people know they can get jobs. So they had all these, and so I met with her and I said, you know, here's what I'd like to do. I could bring these lessons that I've developed at Cheetah Conservation Center. I'd love to come and do some programs, work with your student teachers, be really nice for me. And she said, well, it's right at the end of the term. And so I don't know how many students we would have attend, but would you come and teach a day to my faculty? Because I have all this new faculty, many of them don't know, they're not teaching in a hands-on way, they're just doing lecture. And I said, oh yeah, sure, I'd love to do that. So I went back up there for a day, fairly nervous, and, uh, and they introduced me. There were about, it was voluntary, so there were about 25 faculty members there and uh, five or six student teachers there. And they said, they were introducing me, sort of like Steve, except <laughs> The woman told a little bit about, Stephanie and I were there together, about our backgrounds, and she said, now colleagues, we need to be respectful today. We are here. If you have comments, you need to make comments in a respectful way. We are all working together. And I thought, I am in trouble. <laughs> but it was a great day. They were completely receptive. We had them doing lessons that we had written. We talked about why you would teach in such a way. And, and it was a great day. And they immediately said, how, how soon can you come back? But it was right at my, the end of my time there. So one of the big things I did was to look at the teacher resource guide. Stephanie had sent me this teacher resource guide ahead of time. I had looked at it, and, and I thought, this could use a little work. <laughs> and so I, I, it was not very focused on Cheetah Conservation Fund. It was not very focused really on Namibia. It was pretty generic information in there. And I knew that it needed to have more stuff about what was happening at CCF. What's the research going on here? And how does it relate to what kids in Namibia need to know? Oh, I should back up. Look at this cheetah. Two points in a cheetah stride, they have all four feet off the ground. So you can see that guy's not touching the ground at all. So I had a couple of questions that I really wanted to focus on. And this was my whole idea when I, when I took a sabbatical that I wanted to look at, but I refined it a little bit. So what I wanted to know was how are those different programs at CCF incorporated into their education program? So I knew people were working together, sort of when kids came to, the, to CCF, they might bring the scientists or the researchers or, in to uh, talk to the kids, but I didn't really know if there was much collaboration actually happening. And then I also wanted to know what Namibian teachers needed. So if, if we are expecting those teachers to use this resource guide, what is it they really need in their schools? 
So one of the first things I did was say, ah, do they have standards here? You know, even if you're not in education, you probably have heard Common Core of State Standards and Next Generation Science Standards. So right away I wondered, what kind of standards do they have? So I went to the um, Ministry of Education to find out. It took me quite a bit of digging to find out that they have national syllabi. So every subject at every grade level follows a national syllabus. And they were still using the syllabus that they had been developed from South Africa when Namibia was still dependent on South Africa. So Namibia became independent only 25 years ago. They were still using that curriculum and they had, or that syllabus, and they had just made the shift the same month I arrived to writing their own syllabus and having a brand new syllabus at every subject. And teachers saying, we, we don't know how to make this shift. We don't know what we need to do. We don't have materials. So I looked at the, at the syllabus and I looked at the old teacher resource guide and I went through and tried to match all the lessons in the teacher resource guide with the um, objectives and competencies that they were focused on. And I said, oh, we could do much better. The, this is, these don't work together. They, they just are, are not addressing what students here need to know. So this lesson right here explained the following terms, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, food chain. That objective was when I said, we could write a lesson using that hair that's coming out of the scat, that the that scat detection dog's finding. Because in the genetics lab, they have a resource guide. They're following a resource guide. They're looking through a microscope and they're determining what hair, what, who that hair belongs to. So why can't I get those pictures from the resource guide and get some other pictures and have kids do that? And so here's one of that, here's one of a partial hair from a sheep. So I, I worked with the genetics lab. They helped me design this lesson and we created a whole lesson and got a bunch of pictures that they took through the microscope and then we built this lesson where we gave kids these pictures and we gave them the resource guide and we said, is this cheetah a problem cheetah? Is this cheetah eating wildlife or is it eating farmer's animals? Because all cheetahs get blamed for eating farmer's animals when most of them are not doing that. Most of them are not eating livestock, but they're daytime hunters. So they get blamed for a lot of things. So we were able to, um, to design that lesson and then to ask them to go a step farther. If you find that the cheetah whose hair you're looking at, so I made a scenario, cheetah one, two, three, four. If you're finding that it is a problem cheetah, what can you do about it? And then we had information about livestock guarding dogs and herders and bringing your goats in at night. So it felt to me like, oh, we're on the right path. So I looked at this one too. And it, I, you have some uh, documents, some of you at your table. So I'd been spending all this time out looking at the, um, the game cameras and what, what kind of photos were we getting? What animals are coming to the water holes? So I thought, well, why can't kids do that? Why can't I build a reference guide and then get a bunch of the pictures from those game cameras that are at the watering holes and have kids identify what's going in because they need to know that. This is what their syllabus says. They need to know what's the wildlife in their area and they need to know if there are endangered species. So actually, Jim McKeever helped me with this, <laughs> building the resource guide. But so I'm gonna give you a little, I'm gonna give you a little taste of that lesson and see if you can see what these animals are. So around, Maren's got some too. Here's the reference guide. You have to kind of pair up. Doyle's got one. Oh, and you can use the book. Oh, we'll use the book. You've got the book. I got another book. Here. It's paper clip. You could give it to Nod. So I'm going to put some pictures from the game cameras up on the screen and you see if you can figure out what they are. Here's what the reference guide looked like that we started with building. So here's your first animal. Oh, can you see that well enough? Look at its horns. Jim's not allowed to participate. Oh, 
Oh, April thinks it's a red hartebeest. Anybody have a different idea? Oh, no, it's a red hartebeest. Look at the kudu. You have a kudu on there? Oh, is it on the back? No. Our bingo card doesn't have a Your bingo card doesn't have a kudu on it? Well, there's a little oversight. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> All right. These guys? Oh, I'm sorry. The first one is a kudu. You can tell how old a kudu is by those um, spirals in its horns. So this guy's pretty old. This guy's maybe one, two, three, four, five, maybe six years old. All right, let me take you to this next one. <laughs> warthogs. A little family of warthogs. Okay, ready? Oh, you can't see the honey badger. Oh, that's so unfortunate. Honey badger. Anybody know anything about a honey badger? Have you seen the YouTube videos? Honey badger. Yeah. Honey badgers. You've got to watch that YouTube video if you haven't seen it because they are incredible little animals. They are like a bit like our badger, one of the most ferocious animals out there, and they love to eat snakes, like cobras. So if they, if they go after a cobra and they get bit by a cobra, they'll get bit, they'll sort of go, oh, and they pass out. And then in a couple of minutes, they go, ah, I'm back. <laughs> and they go right back after the cobra. So they, they have no fear. All right, how about this one? Can you see that one well enough? Say it again. Somebody might have had it. <coughs> it's an oryx. That one's an oryx. One of the cool things about these game cameras is this oryx, we call it this, we would see this oryx around and we'd say, oh, there's the one horned oryx, there's the one horned oryx. Now on this game camera, I can see it. It's got both its horns. One is just bent way back on its head for some reason. How about that guy? <laughs> Well, that's the other thing you get on those game cameras. You never quite, you know, those animals get curious. They put their face right up there. <laughs> Can you see that one well enough? Who said that? Black back jackal. Yeah, it kind of looks like a battered fox. And when you see them in the field, sometimes it's a little hard to tell if you don't get a good look. But this one's a black back jackal. We saw these a lot. There, you should know that one. That's a cheetah. Oh, I wish you could see this guy. Can you see it well enough? Look at his cute little face. Look at its ears. Look at the markings on the ears. That's a steenbok. Good. A steenbok. So cute. I don't know. They're about this tall. Really cute. They always look like they had makeup on to me because they got those big eyes, look like their eyelashes. How about that guy? That one's a leopard. Oh, good question, Nathan. Size of the head. Look at the size of that guy's head. Cheetahs have really small heads. Cheetahs are not fighters. They're runners. They're the fastest land animal. They can go 110 kilometers an hour. These guys are fighters. In fact, these guys will chase cheetahs off a kill. So a cheetah needs to eat quickly when it makes a kill because leopards, lions, even hyenas will chase them off their kill because they don't, they don't fight. They have a little tiny head. They have to have a little tiny head and lightweight bones because they're so fast. They just can't be carrying that much um, weight around. In fact, they, they quit nursing their young at two months because they can't afford to carry that milk around. And the mothers are solitary. When she's got her cubs, it's up to her to take care of them. So I, I, I'd been at Cheetah Conservation Center for exactly one month when I went out in the field to check the game cameras with two other women. We drive up to the water hole, 
And just as we got to a water hole, what I thought was a cheetah comes barreling out of there. And I say, cheetah! And they both say, leopard! <laughs> and so the leopard comes past, goes beyond a bush, comes out the other side, and we have to get out of the car. So we have to get out of the car and go check the game cameras now and get the cards out of there and get, check for the battery. And, and, you know, if it were a cheetah, maybe not so worrisome, but a leopard, you, you need to pay some attention. So we get out, we go together, we get the card, we have to measure the size of the watering hole, we have a laser measure, we have to measure how big the watering hole is. So we stuck together, we get back in the car, we don't see the, the leopard again, that's fine. But one of the gals said, oh, I looked at the camera, that, the card that we took out of that game camera, there was leopard, leopard, us. <laughs> we were there right, right with the leopard. <laughs> so you can't see, this is people checking the game cameras, can't really see it. So the other thing that we got to do while we were there, in addition to working hard all the time, and we did actually five and a half days a week you were expected to be working. So, and I, I thought, I didn't think I was gonna work that hard on sabbatical actually, but uh, five and a half days a week. But once a month they did uh, game counts so they followed these certain paths for four days uh, in vehicles, counting all the game you see within a certain distance. And then once every two months, they did water hole counts, 12-hour water hole count, where they take you out to a blind, or what they call a hide, put you in there before daylight with a lunch to get you through the day, like three sandwiches and all this food, because you're there for 12 hours. So they park you there, and you keep track of what you see at that water hole for 12 hours. That, that water hole count came up uh, just a few days after Jim arrived in Namibia. So I'd been there for six weeks when Jim came. And, uh, and I said, oh, we had to do this water hole count. So he was still a little bit on a um, jet lag. But they hauled us out there. So here's our view from our blind. This is what we can see. We're sitting there. We have two little chairs. My biggest concern the whole time was it was a wet season, and cobras and boom slangs and black mambas have been, all these poisonous snakes have been known to enter the blind when people are in there. So that was my biggest worry. I was trying to make sure our door got blocked, but, because you just had this piece of sheet metal you sort of slid over in front of the door. So this, we are, we're in our blind, we're watching this warthog comes. Here we are, all excited. We've got the whole day to be there. And the red heart of East Mina was great. Things are coming in. Jim's seeing all these things for the first time. It's totally fun. There's a lot of zebras around in that area, so they were coming in. And then these guys come. This is actually after we'd been there a couple hours, and Jim said, I'm just going to tip my chair back and take a quick little nap. And I said, all right, I'll wake you up if anything comes. And then it was like, Jim, Jim, it's Eland. So these eland come in, huge, big animals. They're, they remind me of Brahma bulls, really big, impressive animals. So they come in, this herd comes in, they're drinking. And then the first giraffe comes in. So this is Jim's very first giraffe, which are impressive even if you've seen a dozen. But this was amazing. <laughs> And you know, one thing about giraffes, I learned so much about all the wildlife there, but giraffes, they, uh, they can't just bend over and drink or they'll get an aneurysm. They'll blow their heads because they've got so much blood in their neck. So they have to be able to do, I, I think of this as a yoga pose, wide leg forward bend, <laughs> to bend over and get a drink. Or they bend at the knees. So sometimes some of them bend their knees and some bend over like this. The giraffes sleep for 30 minutes a day. They take little cat naps, three to five minute cat naps. All they need is 30 minutes a day. And their tongue, their tongue is black so that it doesn't get sunburned because they always have their tongue out eating, acacia leaves, and it's long enough that they could put it in their ear. So they have this big, long black tongue. <laughs> totally cool. But these eland are huge. Look, this eland's walking under the giraffe to get a drink of water. They're huge, so that tells you something about how big the giraffes are. And it was not, 
you know, we got to do all these amazing things, but also just living there was pretty amazing. I, I heard April ask Jim, you know, do you want to go back and how was it different than South America? Because we've spent quite a bit of time in South America. And I don't know how it's different, but it's different. And it, every, every day was an adventure. Uh, these were one of my favorite birds. These are um, hornbills, yellow-billed hornbills. Has anyone ever seen a hornbill? These guys are so cool. And this one was nesting by our dining hall. So it has this nest box, and it, um, it walls itself in. The female goes in, she and the male together close the hole up, and then she lays her eggs and then molts all of her feathers. She's completely naked in there. She can't, <laughs> if, if something gets the male, she's a goner because she can't fly. So she's sitting in there. The male has to come and feed her all day long, and she sits there until she hatches her eggs and she finally grows her feathers back. And then she emerges, and then she and the male together close the hole up again. And there's just a little slit. And then they, for the next month, are feeding the, uh, the chicks. So then the chicks get ready to come out. This one, they've opened the hole now, and this chick's getting ready to come out of there. And these guys, these parents, with their yellow bill, that's the difference between, you see that dark bill on this one, are all day long getting food, getting food, getting food. So they're constantly trying to get food to get back to their young. So they, that was a whole learning experience for me. I knew nothing about those birds. Here's the world's heaviest flying bird. This is a Cory Bustard. So we saw those frequently. This is my favorite. Oh my God. Lilac breasted rollers. So I love seeing these birds. And they didn't always look like this. The sun had to hit them just right. I heard people calling, they, they'd go, oh yeah, that guy's like an ostrich brain. And I finally get it, you know? That cannot be a very big brain in that little <laughs> tiny head. But there's a huge body. And you'd see them, you know, if you were out on the reserve, you might see ostriches running across the savanna. It's like living in uh, wildlife safari. And then here's this one, look the size of this guy's head. He's got a huge head, a little tiny body. This is a pearl-spotted owlet, and they are predators, very ferocious predators. They feed on birds. This guy hit our window, actually. Hit the window, and we ran out and got it and put it in a box and held on to it for a couple hours and then took it back out, and it had regained its senses and was able to fly off. But someone had told me, if you hear a cacophony in the trees, then you should look around because there could be a pearl-spotted owlet and all the little birds are squawking at it because they want it to get out of there. So sure enough, I would hear that. I'd look around and there'd be this little owlet there. But also, it could be that there was this boom slaying snake in the tree because the birds would do the same thing. And so Jim was in our rendezvous one day and heard all this cacophony going on and goes out and looks in the tree right si outside our door and, and here's this tree snake a huge tree snake, which is incredibly poisonous, but they're mostly in the trees. So if you hear a ruckus, you should look, see what's going on. Every day, warthogs wandering by my rendezvous, I'd see them in the morning. Uh, the baboons were there, baboons going by. Um, you should know this one now. Who is that guy? It was the very first one I showed you. The kudu, the kudu. So if you take a walk around the reserve and get out a little bit away from the center, you might bump into the kudu wandering around. This is my very first giraffe, Janet. I sent this picture to Janet when I was there. Uh, at sunset, I went out with some people and that was my first giraffe. You should know that one too, it's not a cheetah. <laughs> There's another leopard. I actually saw six leopards, which is pretty unheard of while I was there. Although I didn't quite beat Jim because he saw every single cat in Africa while he was there. All of them. Only one leopard though. So hanging out with cheetahs all day long, every day, being able to be there, going out in the run with cheetahs. They exercise them, so you get to see them run. You know, you're watching them. I sent this picture to my sister because we fed cheetahs. Uh, they eat, ate donkeys, so you would get donkeys. And so um, 
every once in a while there would be treat day when the cheetahs would get a donkey head, which they really loved the donkey heads. And that never, w the public never got to see that. But uh, <laughs> probably wouldn't like it very much. So I sent this to my sister. She, I said, this cheetah's looking its lips. And she said, yeah, looking its lips after it's eaten a donkey's head. <laughs> April, did you have a question? Did you get in for the, the pen with them? I mean, any of them? Or were you always on the outside? No, that's a great question. We could, there were some that were up near the center that, that um, there, you ran them. So there was a line like a greyhound, um, like what they used to run greyhounds. And so they would put a little flag on that and run that flag around and the cheetahs would chase it. It's just like a cat. They just wanted to play with that thing. And so they would, people could come in there, pay to come in and they would have maybe five or eight people or something that could be in there and they would run them around. But only with certain cheetahs could you, could you get closer to. Cheetahs that had been there a while, we used to people Every day I'd look out my door and see an amazing sunrise because I left, I slept with my front door open. I, Africa, it was just like it was supposed to be with amazing, incredible sunsets. And that picture you can't see, but there is a, my, that was my very last, um, oh, he can see it on his monitor back there. <laughs> that was my very last night at Cheetah Conservation Fund. I went out on the reserve with a friend. We had a glass of wine. We were watching the sunset, and giraffes came moving through there. So, questions? So how were women and girls received in the educational system? Because other parts of Africa, um, women and girls don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to school. It was pretty. Uh, I don't really need to repeat that, right? Could hear that question. Pretty equal. I didn't see I didn't see problems with that. When school wasn't free, that wasn't the case. So it was the boys that were sent to school. But since education became free for all students, first it was for secondary students, and then a year or two later for the elementary students. And when that occurred, there didn't seem to be a um, discrimination against girls going to school. Um, I heard recently the mortality rate for uh, cheetah cubs was 90 percent. Um, I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, but it, it seems like a species that uh, under currently situations is barely able to survive. And I wondered if its survival in the past was dependent upon having a much larger area in which to operate. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know that information about cubs. I have not heard that, but there are a couple of things. A lot more farmers, so a lot of farmers who don't want predators like that on their land. And that's why I think the Livestock Guarding Dog Program could, could make a huge difference. Namibia has the largest population of wild cheetahs, and there are about 3,000 there. But the other thing that's happening is bush encroachment. So the acacia and the bush, they've stopped fire, like a lot of places, and so the, the bush is encroaching, 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 and cheetahs need space to run. That's how they get their food. And so there's a lot more problems with punctures to the eyes, and one, another thing Cheetah Conservation Fund is doing is harvesting the bush and chopping it up and making bush blocks, so they're selling that now. It's kind of like a press wood, whatever, presto log, only no chemicals in it, so they're pressing it together with steam and selling that. So they're trying to get that out a little bit more because they need to start clearing the brush. That's a big problem. Doyle. <coughs> Talk a little bit about the feeding. Uh, it isn't a natural feeding for all of the animals, is it? Don't they have to supplement? The feeding that we did at the center, you mean? Yes. Um, you're not allowed to feed any uh, wild or living game to the cheetahs. So we fed donkey, people gave, uh, sold or gave donkeys to CCF. The, the, there's lots and lots of donkeys and mules in Namibia. And so 
they would come in, there was a pasture, they'd have some time, they'd hang out, and then they would be slaughtered, brought in, and the meat cut up. There was a team that would cut the meat up and take it out to the cheetahs. But feeding time was really, really pretty amazing because the cheetahs that were at the center, that lived right at the center, at 2 o'clock every day they would be feeding. And so tourists, anybody coming that distance out there could watch the feeding. So that cheetah team would put the food in these big metal bowls. Cheetahs would be kept out. Food would go in their metal bowls. The latch would be open. The cheetahs would run in, zip around, grab their food out of a bowl. Everybody would run around kind of wild. And then they'd all stop and put their food back in a bowl. Because <laughs> cheetahs don't like their food to get dirty. So they, when they make a kill, they hollow out the body of the animal they've killed. And they eat out of a bowl they've made in the animal. They don't want their food in the dirt. But then the, uh, the cheetahs that were farther out, there was this feeding regime where uh, <laughs> there were a couple of different ones. But the more wild cheetahs, you would drive a truck alongside of the fence, on the outside of the fence, drive really fast. The cheetahs would follow the, the truck because they knew there were going to be treats. So they would run on the inside, and you'd be riding on the outside, and people are riding in the back of the truck. So you're trying to hold on. And I tried to video it, but it wasn't very successful. And then you'd stop, and you'd throw out chunks of meat, little pieces like the liver, or little pieces of the liver or the heart. And then you'd take off again around the corner, and the cheetahs would chase you again. And you'd do that a few times until um, they'd gotten some exercise, and then you'd throw their big chunks of meat out over the fence for them. Uh, real quickly, I, the first thought that came to my mind, if you're trying to keep cheetah away from domestic animals, it seems to me odd to be feeding them a domestic <laughs> animal. And do, do, do they get a taste for that kind of meat? And then, you know, uh, they say that about wolves around here. If they start eating beef, then they're going to want to go back. And do, is, is there anything like that going on? That, that's a good question, Steve. I, I did not hear about that. I don't think cheetahs naturally prey on donkeys. So um, they will prey on goats. They will prey on sheep. And mostly they do that when it's opportunistic. You know, you have your goat herd out there. A cheetah comes along. It's hungry. There's no, there's no livestock guarding dog. There's no herder. There's nobody around. So it's like, whoa, <laughs> free meal. But if there's anything around, um, cheetahs are, are scared off pretty easily. And I don't, I haven't ever heard anything about um, the relationship between feeding them donkey meat and, and encourage them to eat donkeys. And uh, just a follow-up question, not quite related to that, but, but you mentioned several times how leopards had predated um, both the adult and the juvenile cheetahs. It, it, is, the, is the leopard population connected at all to the expansion of the bush? Because they tend to be more of a kind of a secretive character, and, and if the population dynamics are getting whacked out, then maybe the cheetah's having a hard time with that. I, and I don't know the answer to that. that I mean, that, that seems pretty plausible, because the leopards can get through the brush. They're not dependent on speed. They, they actually will, if there are lions around, leopards will drag their food up into a tree. So they like, they like the the brush. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to know if the leopard population was increasing or not. And I'm not sure if anybody's studying leopards to know that. I, I, I'll volunteer to go and do that <laughs> for you. Yes? You talked about lions, but you didn't show any. I didn't. Are there are lions there? There are, and I actually do have a couple pictures that I um, didn't show. There are not lions at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. So on that 100,000 acres, there are no lions. The lions have been, people, people don't like cheetahs, and they really don't like lions. So the lions are mostly now in the national parks. So we saw quite a few lions um, in the national park, but not on farmer's land or on this kind of land. I could show, I'll show you a picture. Carol. You got to get the microphone here. Sorry. Oh, um, it just seems like there's just a huge diversity of animals. Uh, in, in the, are they all protected in this park, or is this is this typical for the country, for this particular? Well, is, are they individual countries in Africa? The, it it was um, it was typical for this. 
So what they have something in Namibia called conservancies where the landowners agree that they'll let the wildlife move back and forth freely. So if you become part of that conservancy, you agree to not build game fences. So Cheetah Conservation Fund was part of the Waterbird Conservancy. And the landowners, uh, except for one, all the landowners around them were also part of that conservancy. So that the wildlife could move freely, except for the rhinos um, and the zebra. Actually, the zebra were in a place where they, because people don't want zebras. They, they eat too much grass. So, but otherwise, yeah, there was a lot of diversity and it's pretty typical. I mean, you can be driving down the road to the, to the um, capital on the highway and maybe see a giraffe off to the side. You just, it's just there. We, we have time for uh, a couple of short questions. Okay. Anybody else? One more. I was intrigued by what you mentioned about uh, natural fire uh, being suppressed and there being expansion of bush. Uh, of course, humans have been in Africa longer than any other continent, and humans are closely associated with fire, often using fire to create an environment that's more uh, uh, congenial to humans, uh, the Willamette Valley, for instance. Uh, um, so has there, I was interested if you, if you knew about the nature of the reduction in fire, whether it's simply from, like there is a suppression of natural fire or whether humans are being discouraged from starting fires they used to start or they changed their lifestyle in such a way that they're not using fire and land the way they used to. I, I think it's all of those. I think that um, actually a few, uh, maybe, two years before I went to CCF, their, their main office building was hit by lightning and burned down. And so, and then also they had a fire in one of their, in part of the big field, part of the reserve. And they, they are totally against fire, which is interesting because some of their scientists are not, and some of the researchers are not. But I think it's just, if it gets started and comes through like the center, they're wiped out. And so people don't want to take that risk. If they do have, we saw some areas that had had natural fire that were growing back really well. And so if it's far enough removed, but nobody really wants to take the risk and they don't want to, they don't want to lose their wildlife or their game or whatever it might be. So they are really, there really is that standoffishness about letting a fire burn. One, one more question, and then we'll have to we'll wrap it up here. If not, I will. You have a question. Thank you again. You're welcome. Um, I, 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 but before before you do it, I have you have to tell the story about Jim and the lion, <laughs> please. Is that is that uh, well, there's a wildebeest and a water buffalo? That was that story when I hit him. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah. So we were in a national park in, I think we were in Botswana, actually. And we, you are only allowed out of your car in certain places. So there's signs everywhere when you're in any of those national parks. Do not leave your vehicle. Do not leave your vehicle. Well, those kind of rules m normally don't apply to Jim. But, <laughs> but in this case, we had stopped in a place where you are actually allowed to get out of your car. And I don't know what makes it OK in one place and not in another. But we'd gotten out of our car. We had our daughter and a friend, another 19-year-old girl with us. So we'd gotten out, we'd eaten lunch, we'd had all our food on the back of the pickup, and, and uh, we're just putting everything away, getting back, getting ready to get in the car, when another vehicle drives up and they said, oh, have you seen any lions? And we said, well, not right here. And they said, oh, we were just here yesterday and there were a pair of female lions here, two lionesses, and we're like, Oh, yeah, we'll get back in the car now. And the, I mean, there were bathrooms there, so you're allowed out. So we get in the car. They said, these people are like, we're looking for the lions. We're hoping we get to see them again. And we said, yeah, we're hoping too. So we get in the car. We drive around the corner, and, and we run into the two lionesses. They're walking down the road. And so, and Jim's got his window all the way down. And I said, roll up the window. And Jim's like, I don't need to roll up the window. And the lions are coming closer and closer. I said, roll up the window. Jim's like, I don't need to roll out the window. 
the lion's getting closer and closer. I, I didn't really realize I was doing it, but I did pick up a book and smack him and say, roll out the window! <laughs> and here's the lion! <laughs> he actually put the window up at that point. <laughs> Uh, he had the same kind of experience with an elephant, too. We were, uh, we were right close to these elephants. That one actually made him quiver a little bit, too, because that elephant came. Oh, I might have that picture, too. These were, not, these were in, uh, in different places, not on CCF land. There, that elephant got pretty close to us, too. And, and when an elephant comes like that, you, you just have to not move. You just don't move. If you sit still and you're quiet, most likely the elephant will move on past and you'll be just fine. And in every case for us, it did. We did see a, a case where an elephant put its trunk down on a car and just smashed. I think the car had revved its engine or something and the elephant was just like, it smashed the, the roof in. And I did right after I got there in the national park just north of us, uh, a rhino had rammed the side of a car and uh, dented in the car. <laughs> Rhinos are a little bit cantankerous, so you want to do the same thing. Don't move, because they have really bad eyesight. So if they don't quite see you around, then you're probably OK. But they, they can be kind of cranky. All right. Thank That's you, it. Donna, for Thank Adventures you. in Africa. <laughs>